Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I guess we'll get started. It's one o'clock. Just, there we go. So today's topic is environmental protection through hydrocarbon leak detection. Uh, microphones are muted throughout the presentation. So if you do have a question, please use the chat functionality in the meeting. You can type your questions in by clicking on the Q&A and uh, broadcasting a message out. Hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end of the presentation where we can uh, respond to those. And if not, we'll definitely follow up uh, following the presentation. So today's agenda is uh, as follows. We'll spend a couple minutes talking about Novatech. And then we'll we'll get into the nature of heat exchangers and the leaks and why we actually care about monitoring for them. Uh, look at the various ways uh, leaks can present themselves and the nature of the hydrocarbons themselves. And then we'll focus in on one specific technology, which is known as sparging or approach, I should say, and look at uh, the sparger design that Novatech has created and implemented. I'll show you some example systems and uh, we'll summarize it all up at the end. So let's start with Novatech. Uh, we are a Canadian company. We are an exclusive distributor of analytical instrumentation. Uh, our focus is on analyzers, the systems that are required to make those analyzers work, environmental shelters as necessary, and of course, the support that comes uh, after the, the sale uh, with, from our factory trained technicians. As a distributor, our goal or our purpose a lot of times is to evaluate uh, our clients' applications and determine what the best approach is uh, to help solve them. Uh, as an example, uh, monitoring for, for oxygen, for example, there might be half a, different, half a dozen different technologies that can do that. And it's our goal or our uh, job to evaluate the best approach that fits the client's needs, budget, uh, and requirements. Uh, so rather than forcing a, a square peg through a round hole, we'll look at the best solution for the application. In support of the analyzers and the manufacturers that we represent, we also have an engineering team, quite an extensive team, located in our facilities in Montreal and Calgary. Uh, it's their role to design and fabricate the systems that we need to integrate these analyzers into our clients' processes. A lot of times the analyzers are extractive in nature. We have to pull the sample from the process to the analyzer to do its job. So a sample conditioning system is required. Uh, oftentimes these analyzers aren't suited to be installed directly outdoors, especially through Canadian winters. So they might need environmental protection, a building perhaps. And of course, there are regulatory requirements that have to be observed as well. Uh, electrical approval to the Canadian Electrical Code, hazardous area certification, CRM for pressurized systems, et cetera. And finally, the after sales support is, uh, is a key factor in ensuring that these systems uh, continue to function as they were designed to. So we have 13 factory trained technicians located across Canada. Uh, and they are there to support with both on-site um, uh, service and maintenance uh, and or bench repairs if analyzers or equipment is sent back to our facilities uh, where we keep a large inventory of spare parts in stock to ensure that we can turn around those rep repairs as quickly as possible. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about heat exchangers and the leaks that uh, we're concerned about. In its simplest term, a heat exchanger is some kind of device or unit that's designed to transfer heat between two fluids. Uh, there are direct heat exchangers where the fluids are in direct contact with one another. So in other words, a hot uh, fluid and a cold fluid. Typically, uh, air is a, is a common uh, uh, fluid for a direct heat exchanger. If you think of cooling towers that we often see at uh, industrial plants, those are direct heat exchangers where the air is actually the cooling medium and it's in direct contact with the, uh, the water that's being cooled. Indirect heat exchangers have a physical barrier between the two fluids. Uh, a shell and tube heat exchanger as shown right here uh, is a good example of that. So we have a hot fluid 
uh, on one side of the barrier, a cold fluid on the other side of the barrier. And uh, the purpose is to transfer heat from the hot to the cold, uh, either to cool down or uh, to warm up, depending on what the application may be. In either case, leaks in the barriers will allow cross-contamination of either the water into the process fluid or the cooling fluid, I should say, or the process fluid into the cooling medium. So why do we care about that? Well, cooling water is one of the most uh, commonly used cooling fluids, and it can be used in typically two different uh, uh, ways. A closed cooling water circuit is what we often see when you see cooling towers as shown in the picture there. Cold water is uh, circulated to the process heat exchangers. It brings the heat from those heat exchangers back to the cooling towers where it is cooled by the air. That's a direct heat exchanger there. And then it's circulated back out again. So it's a closed loop. It's a closed circuit. Um, there's no uh, water loss other than through evaporation typically. In once through cooling water systems, we're relying on water coming from a nearby body of water, be it a river or a lake or something like that. So the water is brought in, it goes through the process heat exchangers, and then it goes back out into that river or lake. Either way, a, a leak in one of those heat exchangers is a problem. Uh, it's obvious that's a problem when we have a once through cooling water system. If we're contaminating that cooling water with the process fluid, uh, and oftentimes it's it's a hydrocarbon of some sort, that hydrocarbon is now being uh, sent out into that body of water. We're polluting the water effectively. But even in a closed circuit, uh, those leaks can be problematic as well. Uh, depending on the volatility of the hydrocarbon, they may actually flash off and uh, uh, come out as gas and accumulate potentially to dangerous levels where we might have actually a hazardous atmosphere that could uh, ignite and cause a, a fire or an explosion. Uh, but at the very least, those fugitive emissions are being uh, sent out into the atmosphere as VOCs. And uh, both of those are scenarios that we would want to uh, uh, avoid in, in, in any situation. The way these leaks can develop over time uh, varies, of course. Uh, they can be slow, they can be very rapid. Obviously, if it's a rapid catastrophic leak, you don't need a very sophisticated system to detect that, it'll be very obvious. Uh, but slow leaks can uh, develop very slowly over time. It can start as just a crack or a pinhole due to corrosion uh, or stress cracking or, or something like that. And the way the hydrocarbon or the form that the hydrocarbon takes as it, as it transfers into the cooling fluid, uh, water, for example, uh, can vary. It can come through as a gas. It could be uh, a liquid that does not readily dissolve into the water. And now we have a two-phase solution, water and hydrocarbon in a bit of an emulsion potentially, or the hydrocarbons could dissolve into the water and, uh, and now it's, in, it's fully in solution, or it could be a combination of all three of these potentially. Depending on how the leak uh, forms or the nature of the leak may have an impact on how we want to measure it, or definitely will actually. For gaseous leaks, headspace monitoring makes sense. Uh, if there's an accumulation of, uh, of uh, hydrocarbons in a region, uh, those could be detected potentially by something as simple as a gas detector. Now you might argue that it would take quite a bit of hydrocarbons in the liquid phase to be detectable by uh, uh, an LEL gas detector, and there's some truth to that. So it might not be the best approach necessarily. When we're looking at two-phase liquids, that, that non-solution uh, or that non-emissible uh, mixture, if you will, optical techniques come into play. We, we could use something like turbidity to look for that haze that would de develop over time as more and more hydrocarbon globules or droplets are apparent in the water. Sheen detection is another approach if we have situations where the water uh, has settling uh, ponds or areas where the flow is quite low. Hydrocarbons are lighter than water typically, and so they, they will rise to the surface and form a sheen on the surface. And that's easily detectable by analyzers uh, that, that we sell, for example. Um, if it's in solution, there's a number of different ways of looking at it. 
Uh, it can be measured potentially spectroscopically, perhaps with UV analyzers. Gas chromatography might be able to separate it out. And the other question that one has to really think about is, what type of measurement are we trying to actually achieve? Is it a quantitative measurement for the purposes of staying under some regulatory emission limit? Uh, we must not have more than X number of uh, micrograms per liter of hydrocarbons in our water. That necessitates a certain type of analysis. If it's purely a qualitative analysis, I have a leak, therefore I have a problem, then we have a lot more flexibility in the approach. Certainly for any kind of compliance quantitative analysis uh, of two-phase or solutions, the total organic carbon analyzer or chemical oxygen demand analyzer is the way to go. The benefit of this technology or this technique is that it really measures the sample as a whole. Uh, it oxidizes the entire sample, including the, the hydrocarbons. Therefore, you miss nothing. You don't lose anything in its, uh, in its analysis. So let's move on to sparging. And this is the technique that we're going to focus on for the remainder of the presentation. Uh, spargers for analyzers uh, aren't new. They've been around for quite some time. And effectively what they are, or essentially, is some kind of vessel that allows us to bring into contact the liquid that contains the analyte that we're interested in, so the water that contains potentially hydrocarbon, and some kind of gas that we will use to pull out that hydrocarbon that we're trying to measure. That's the sparge gas. Uh, there's different designs, different ways of doing it. The one shown here on the left uh, represents uh, essentially a counterflow approach where the water comes in at the top and the sparge gas is bubbled in through the bottom. And there's a packing media in there that allows a lot of contact and time uh, in contact between the water and the gas, maximizing the amount of volatiles that we extract from it. Uh, this approach is uh, similar, except that we're basically what we have is uh, a, a level amount or a certain amount of the water that's fed in from the bottom and that goes out through an overflow. And we're diffusing gas through it using a, a very fine uh, uh, diffuser, like a ceramic frit of some kind, something that allows our air to bubble through in very, very tiny bubbles. The more, the smaller the bubbles are and the greater the number of them, the greater the surface area of contact between the liquid phase and the gas phase, and the more uh, we'll uh, be able to extract some of those hydrocarbons from it. There's a number of variables that control the efficiency or the, the effectiveness of these uh, uh, designs, the, the flow rates, of course, the temperature, uh, the, uh, all of these things. But ultimately, it is assumed to be following what's uh, uh, known as Henry's Law. And we'll get to that in a couple more slides. As an analytical technique, uh, sparging has been used in the laboratory uh, quite some time for quite some time, and it continues to be used today. Uh, techniques such as sparge and integrate, sparge and capture are great in the laboratory environment where time isn't necessarily uh, of the essence. We have a sample that maybe was taken from the field, it's brought in, and we can take the time to sparge it for 10, 15 minutes, an hour, whatever is required to extract as much of the hydrocarbons as, as possible from it, send it off to some kind of analyzer and do our analysis. That's not really suitable for the purposes of leak, leak detection. If we think about leak detection, we want something fast, especially in the situation where we're dealing with once through cooling water. If you can imagine a plant uh, physically located adjacent to that body of water, the time it takes for the water to be pulled out of the river, go through the various heat exchangers and be sent back out to the river might be tens of minutes, potentially, maybe certainly less than an hour, I would say. So we can't have an analysis technique that takes an hour or more. We want something that's fast so that if we detect a leak, we can take immediate action divert that water, don't send it back into the river, uh, put it into a holding pond and take corrective action to identify where the leak is coming from and, and repair it if necessary. So sparging uh, a fixed volume like we saw in the laboratory techniques earlier isn't really a suitable solution. 
Uh, finally, the, the main thing, and this is true of any analyzer, is we need to something that is robust and has a high availability. Uh, if the system isn't running, it isn't monitoring. If it isn't running because it takes uh, 10, 15 minutes for it to do an analysis, then that's 10 or 15 minutes too long. If it isn't running because it's breaking down all the time, or it's complex or, or needs a lot of, of preventive maintenance to keep it running, that's not useful either. So a quick word about Henry's Law, and it's important to look at this because it, it really is what has guided the design of the Novatex Barger technology. Um, in, in its most basic form, Henry's Law relates the concentration uh, in the vapor phase to what the concentration was in the aqueous phase. So what there was in the, in the aqueous phase or vapor phase is a function of what was in the aqueous phase. Uh, and there's a constant here, but this is what's most interesting to us, is that the pressure that the system is operated at is on the denominator. So it stands to reason that if I can lower this pressure, I increase the concentration in the vapor phase. And remember, that is ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to take hydrocarbons in solution in our water, pull them out into our sparge gas in the vapor phase, and do our analysis in the vapor phase. So by lowering the pressure of the system, I increase the sparging efficiency of my system. So this is how it's done. The process water is the water coming from the heat exchanger, uh, and it is uh, flowing through what I would call basically a, a jet pump or a, a sparger for all intents and purposes. Uh, and anybody who's studied uh, flow or fluid dynamics will recognize what we see here as the liquid is constricted because it's non-compressible, it increases in velocity. And as it increases in velocity, it creates a negative pressure around this point, which is known as the vena contracta. And so the sparge gas that we're bringing in over here is coming into a negative pressure, pressure zone, if you will, uh, approximately half an atmosphere. So as it mixes with the liquid, the gas, the air bubbles here are under negative pressure, which means their ability to pull the volatile hydrocarbons out of the liquid phase and into the bubble will greatly increase. So what we have here is our, our process water coming in, our cooling water, a gas coming in here, typically air, and mixture of gas and liquid coming out of this, this jet pump. So now we've created the environment where we have maximized the efficiency of the sparging. We have the most uh, uh, sparging or uh, uh, transfer from the uh, aqueous phase to the vapor phase. It's well mixed. It's everything we wanted to accomplish, but we want to separate them now because we want to measure in the gas phase. Our analyzer doesn't want to see the liquid. How do we accomplish that? So that's the, say, the separator's uh, job, basically. The phase separation is accomplished in this vessel, and I'll show a cutaway of it that will uh, uh, explain its operation quite effectively. But essentially, the mixture of gas and liquid, that frothy liquid, comes down into this vessel, and by its design, the liquid will flow out through the water drain, and the gas will flow out through one of these openings at the top here, where we can do its analysis. And this is what the cross section of that uh, hydraulic separator looks like. So here comes my frothy liquid of mixture of water and air down through this inner tube that is mounted inside another tube. So these are concentric tubes. And you'll notice that the end of this tube is higher than the end of the outer tube. That allows the gas bubbles as they leave to mostly go up through this annular space around this inner tube. Some of them will escape, but as long as we are capturing most of them, that's fine. The height of the water outlet, as the water comes out here, will basically fill this vessel up to this line here, this blue line, and then drain out by gravity. The difference in height between that water level and the bottom of this tube creates the pressure that pushes these air bubbles out through my outlet here. 
that differential pressure, if that difference in height is 20 inches, then I have 20 inches of water gauge of pressure. And that's plenty uh, to drive the gas through whatever equipment I need and get it to my analyzer, especially if it's located uh, directly adjacent to this, uh, to this hydraulic separator. So from there, we need to think about what we're doing with the gas. I now have gas coming out of that separator. Of course, it's also saturated with water vapor because it's been in direct contact with the water. And the dew point of that water vapor will effectively be whatever the temperature of the water was. So if my water coming from my heat exchanger is coming in hot, and when I say hot, I mean, higher than the temperature in which this system is installed. If this system is installed in a control room or in an analyzer building that's maintained at 20, 22 degrees C, something like that, and my water is coming in at 40, 50 degrees C, then it's clearly much hotter than the ambient conditions. And the dew point of that uh, water vapor in my air coming out be 40, 50 degrees C. That's a problem because now as it travels from my system towards my analyzer, water, the gas will start to cool because it's only in 22 degrees C air and water droplets will start to form. They'll condense inside the tube. I don't want that. I certainly don't want that in my analyzer because it could damage it. So what I will do then is I will force the temperature back down immediately as it comes out of my separator down to a temperature well below the ambient temperature. So my ambient temperature is 22, I might force it down to five degrees C or four degrees C. So now uh, the condensate will be forming here, it'll just drain back down into the separator and be carried off. And my gas coming out of here now has a dew point of only four or five degrees C. There's no longer any risk of condensation happening from that point on, I have a dry gas going to my analyzer. Another note here is that this uh, leg, this condensate drain, because we bring it in near the bottom of this separator, uh, there will always be a liquid level inside this leg and have no risk of gas going out through that uh, liquid leg. It effectively forms a liquid seal. In the case where my water is coming in at a temperature below the ambient conditions, it's much simpler. All I really need to be concerned about is just uh, bringing the temperature up as quickly as I can so that uh, I'm away from that dew point temperature. I can do that easily with just uh, a finned uh, heat exchanger, if you will, that will bring the gas temperature up to whatever the room temperature is, and then I can carry on and go to whatever my detection means is from there on. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Well, that's all well and good. We've, we've talked about how spargers work, uh, how our, our concept was formed uh, and, and what the theory is behind it, did it actually do what we expected it to do? So again, we talked about how this is all dictated by Henry's law and Raoult's law that talks about the partial pressures of, uh, of various components, but not everything behaves the way we expect it to behave. There's all sorts of things that can have an, imp an impact on our ability to sparge the gas, but more importantly, whether or not uh, it works for all components or what components does it work for. We really had to do some testing to find out uh, how this system worked and to prove it to our customers as well. So a test system was built, an actual fully functional test rig uh, with the equipment that you saw earlier, the jet pump, the uh, separator, and uh, an infrared um, analyzer, non-dispersive gas analyzer. The first test that we did, we tried doing basically direct injection of, uh, of uh, hydrocarbons into the water stream, a closed loop water stream to see how that was working. And uh, we found that that was a bit difficult. Uh, there was far too much hydrocarbon, the response was crazy. So then we prepared solutions um, to see if we could uh, find uh, something a little bit better. So how did we find uh, the right solution? Well, we said, okay, well, let's use pentane as our test hydrocarbon that we're going to uh, uh, measure. We looked at the absorption spectra of pentane and we found that methyl ethyl ketone, while it does have some interferences in the same area, is a far, far lower uh, absorber of infrared energy. So the first tests were done with pentane 
uh, diluted in methyl ethyl ketone to see whether or not we could prove out the performance of the system. So these are the first results uh, that we uh, we achieved. <clears throat> Excuse me. These were 20, 20 microliter uh, dilutions of 251 dilutions of hydrocarbons. And you can see that we met uh, tested with pentane all the way up to uh, no name, so C5 to C9. And we were measuring with a, um, an NDIR analyzer range zero to 50 parts per million. And we got excellent response. And the nice thing is, is the all of the um, hydrocarbons we're pretty much following a similar response pattern and we're more or less along the lines of what we predicted would happen uh, with our modeling. So the good news is it works. Uh, there's still some fine tuning to be done and further testing to prove it out even further and see what the true performance limits were. But these first tests were very, very encouraging. So then we chose to look at uh, chloroform as our dissolving agent rather than methyl ethyl ketone. Uh, and as you can see, chloroform's absorption is completely uh, away from where our hydrocarbons tended to be absorbing. And that would ensure that we would effectively not influence the reading uh, by the, uh, the actual background that we were carrying uh, our hydrocarbon sample in. So again, testing with uh, pentane and this time decane in chloroform. So injections diluted in chloroform. So you can see here, excellent uh, response, uh, even 10 microliters, 50 to one in decane. And then when we looked at the chloroform, straight chloroform injections, 500 microliters, there's no response whatsoever. So we established that the chloroform had no influence on the reading itself, and that we were still getting excellent response with uh, uh, decade uh, from pentane all the way up to decade uh, in 50 to one uh, uh, dilutions. So uh, the summary of all this testing established essentially that with that zero to 50 ppm uh, non-dispersive infrared gas analyzer, we were seeing responses of in this region, in that 10 to 14, 15 parts per million, when we injected 50 parts per billion of hydrocarbons in water. So I'll let you think about that for a second. If we think about what's happening here, we're equating 50 ppb in the liquid phase. By the time we have sparged it out and brought it out into the vapor phase, that comes out as tens of parts per million. That's 200 to 300 times greater a concentration than what we had in the vapor phase. And if we flip it around backwards, it means that this analyzer essentially can measure concentrations in the parts per billion, even though it is ranged in the parts per million. That is the real beauty of the sparging technology. There's a multiplication effect that happens when we are sparging the, the volatile hydrocarbons from the liquid phase into the vapor phase. So as a result, uh, momentary concentration of 30 parts per billion of normal pentane uh, was reliably detected and we were getting a response within 49 seconds. So we achieved our goal of less than a one minute response time. Uh, going up further into higher hydrocarbons, C6 to C8 uh, showed uh, an equivalent response and by the time we got to C10, we were seeing a drop off in responsiveness, uh, but only down to 30%. So it's still able to pick it up, but we are losing some of that sensitivity. Uh, in the end, uh, we, we have determined that uh, the detection limits for this technology are from as good as plus or minus uh, three parts per billion uh, when we're down at normal C5, to plus or minus 10 parts per billion when we get up to C10. So that's kind of our range of operations, C5s to C10s, uh, and we, we have as uh, no worse than a plus or minus 10 ppb detection limit. So knowing that we have that multiplicative effect of going from the aqueous phase to the vapor phase means that we can look at a number of different techniques uh, we did our testing with a non-dispersive infrared gas analyzer, but who says we couldn't use a gas detector potentially? 
Uh, or what if we went in the other direction and went for something much more powerful, like a gas chromatograph? Um, and we've done all three. The benefits of the gas detector are obvious. It's very robust. It's a very industrialized design. It's, it's meant to be installed in difficult and harsh environments. So from that perspective, we don't have to worry about putting it out in the field in a cabinet or something like that. Uh, they tend to have a fast response. Uh, obviously, they're the lowest cost solution in terms of detection technology that we're talking about. Uh, they're an integrated solution. In other words, the detector uh, and the electronics, if you will, are meant to be mounted adjacent to the sparging system. Or uh, it wouldn't make any sense to transport the, the, the uh, sample from the sparger to a gas detector mounted you know, 100 feet away or something like that, when this is so small, it can be mounted directly adjacent to it. Now, gas detectors, infrared or cat bead gas detectors, are designed to monitor in what's known as the percent LEL range, lower explosive limit. And if I use methane as an, as an example, uh, the lower explosive limit of methane is 4%, or pardon me, 5%, which is 50,000 parts per million. So these are tens of thousands of parts per million. Based on that, and based on the data we showed earlier, these gas detectors are able to measure in the range of 50 parts per million thereabouts or less potentially. So a gas detector that's normally measuring in the tens of thousands of parts per million is now measuring in the tens of parts per million. Similarly with the non-dispersive infrared gas analyzer, we saw the data earlier. These are robust as well, they're very fast. Uh, they're going to be more expensive than a gas detector, but certainly in terms of their performance and capabilities, they do bring benefits. These could be used or adapted to either an integrated or a separated solution. Again, what I mean by an integrated solution is the analyzer is mounted out in the field with the sparger, either in a cabinet or whatever it is, or it could be separated. The sparger is located here, and the analyzer is in a control room or an analyzer building, and we're simply transporting the gas to it from the sparger. Either way would work with something like this. And because of the fact that these are now able to measure much lower concentrations in gas detectors, remember our range with our tests was zero to 50 parts per million, that translates into detecting leaks in the, leaks in the parts per billion in the aqueous phase. And finally, we can look at something like a gas chromatograph. Uh, obviously, gas chromatographs are incredibly powerful. Uh, uh, they can be designed and built to do multiple analyses, many different things. However, they're definitely going to be more expensive, uh, expensive sorry, and they're certainly going to be slower. Gas chromatographs are not continuous analyzers. They, they have a cycle time associated with them. The sample is brought to the analyzer and then periodically injected into the system. And then the analyzer will do its thing and spit out a number X number of minutes later. So speed of response is certainly going to be less with a gas chromatograph. Uh, but the biggest benefit is the ability, to, uh, sorry, the ability to do speciated analysis. Uh, a single cooling water loop uh, might be serving multiple heat exchangers in multiple parts of a, of, a, of a plant. So it could be that it's being exposed to different hydrocarbons in different heat exchangers. The ability to determine what the hydrocarbon is, not just if there is a hydrocarbon present, can be incredibly powerful. It can tell the technician that, yes, there's a leak, and it happens to be this, which may be able to uh, allow pinpointing of which heat exchanger is leaking and uh, eliminate a lot of guesswork or samples that have to be taken to, de to determine that otherwise. Also, one thing that can be done with a gas chromatograph is they're very powerful and can be set up to monitor multiple uh, trains simultaneously. So you could, for example, uh, set up one train to do a rapid analysis, a continuous online rapid analysis that gives a result relatively quickly, perhaps uh, 90 seconds or something like that. And then another train that's doing the speciated analysis that can take several minutes. So one train would be there as the fast leak detection potentially, and the other is the one that tells you where the leak is coming from. 
So uh, all looks good so far. Everything I've shown you uh, up until now, however, is either theory or tests that we've done. Does it actually work? You bet. Let's look at systems that we've built and that have been installed and running for years. Um, ranging in complexity, we'll start with some of the simplest. Uh, basic systems with gas detector mounted on a plate, installed either in a shelter or in a control room or something like this. No chiller, super basic. And, and the one thing that is probably worth mentioning here, if I haven't already, is compared to so many other systems and technologies that, that even we sell, this is so simple. It's hydraulic in its operation. Uh, the water flow is essentially what dictates the sparge gas uh, intake rate. The separator is completely hydraulic. Uh, in this case, we have no chiller. Uh, it's just the room air that acclimates the sample back up. This is, this is the case where the water was colder than the room. And in this case, we're just using a basic gas detector. So super simple, super robust, which means you're going to have a very high uptime and reliability. Here's another one, uh, again, but this time mounted in the field. But this is another example of one where it was very basic, uh, just a gas detector, completely hydraulic, no chiller involved in this case, mounted in the field. So obviously there's a, a small heater in there just to maintain the temperature. But beyond that, that's it. Again, same kind of design, gas detector only, no chiller involved. Here's a situation where we have a separated system. Uh, this client was uh, uh, using a total organic carbon analyzer and TOC analyzers by their very nature uh, are complex and they require maintenance. Uh, sometimes they require a lot of maintenance. Uh, this uh, particular uh, TOC analyzer also used reagents and uh, things of that nature, chemicals that had to be filled into the analyzer. And it was, it was a bit of a maintenance headache for the, the client. So the client, which also had GCs or gas chromatographs on the site and was incredibly familiar with the GCs, well-trained technicians, uh, decided that if we could use a sparger system, then we can just use a GC. We know GCs, we understand them, we can easily uh, service them. Uh, and the front end of this, which is the sparger, is incredibly reliable. So that, that's what made sense uh, to them. Uh, the second part of it, which was useful, was that this stream serves multiple heat exchangers. And so the GC gave them the ability to do that speciated analysis uh, that they were looking for to be able to pinpoint where is the leak coming from if there is a leak. So in this case, we had the sparger system field mounted uh, inside this cabin, uh, this small clamshell enclosure with a heater, and then the, the, the gas containing the sparged hydrocarbons is carried through a heated sample line. You can see the boot coming out here to the GC, which is mounted in a building nearby. Uh, so this entire assembly is the, uh, the water or the prep section. The GC does the analysis some, somewhere uh, remotely. In this case, you'll see that our separator here is not made out of stainless steel. It is actually made out of a material called QVF, which is like a, a Pyrex, basically. And it's also quite a bit taller than the other ones we saw before. Uh, just going back to the point we mentioned earlier, that height, that elevation between the drain and the bottom of the tube is what gives us the pressure to push our gas to the GC. So because we had more distance uh, to transport the gas, we needed a bit more pressure. Therefore, we needed something taller. Uh, in this case as well, uh, because the process was, uh, was potentially uh, using water uh, that might have contaminants such as uh, rust and sediment, things like that. The ability to look and just see if there was accumulation of particulate in the bottom of the uh, separator was useful to the client. Uh, they could easily just stop the flow, drain the, the, the separator, clean it, whatever is necessary, start, up, start it up again and away you go. Uh, and here's another example from uh, another client. In this case, they, they went and did uh, a project to look at all of their uh, closed loop, or pardon me, uh, once through cooling water systems. Uh, they bought 14 of these sparger systems in a variety of configurations, depending on whether 
whether or not they, they had pressure, what the temperature of the water was. Uh, this is kind of like the, the, the most complex system you're seeing here. It needed a pump, it needed a chiller, which means it needed to be in an air conditioned and heated cabinet. But all of these systems are mounted out in the field. And other than the pump and the chiller, the rest of it is exactly what we saw before. And again, still just a, a, a gas detector in this case, uh, which uh, gave them the uh, detection limit that they were looking for. As a bonus, it's worth mentioning that this technique can easily work with steam condensate as well. Uh, if, if the process is one where the steam or the water uh, is the heating fluid, in other words, we're using steam to heat up a process, uh, then the likelihood, uh, the possibility of leaks of hydrocarbons getting into the steam can be really damaging. We want that water to be pristine, ultra pure, because as it's going through the boiler system, uh, any contaminants could actually cause quite a bit of damage. So monitoring the steam condensate, uh, it's the same technique again here. Uh, it's just a matter of bringing the water, ensuring it's not uh, boiling, obviously, or steam and condensing it down, bringing the pressure and the temperature down to more manageable levels, but then the rest of the system is exactly as you've seen before. So in conclusion, some of the features that are really worth mentioning is, again, it is hydraulically operated. There are no moving parts unless a pump is required, uh, potentially a chiller, but it, oftentimes there's absolutely no moving parts whatsoever. The water is the driving medium for all intents and purposes. It's fast, speed of response in less than a minute, which is what you need for a leak detection system that could potentially be uh, diverting or stopping contaminated water uh, from going back into a river or lake. Uh, it operates under vacuum, uh, which means that we can get those detection limits down into the parts per billion uh, range of detector technologies. The front end is the sparger, but what we put on the back end in terms of analyzers is varied. It can be as simple as a gas detector all the way up to gas chromatograph. It's robust. The jet adductor, again, no diffuser like you would have like in a, a packed column uh, or using one of those ceramic fritz to, to create those bubbles in a traditional sparger. All those things potentially can clog or get contaminated, things like that. The jet adductor doesn't suffer from those, those types of issues. It's, it's basically just a nozzle. Ease of calibration. Uh, we calibrate the sensing elements like we would traditionally. So if it's a gas detector or an infrared gas analyzer, we're simply, simply bringing zero in span gas and calibrating it as we traditionally would. The validation of the system can be done using the septum seal. And if you saw in my earlier slides, when we were doing that uh, injection of hydrocarbons either directly or in solution, there's a septum seal in the system that allows you to prepare your solutions ahead of time and using a syringe, a needle and a syringe, inject it into the stream and ensure that the system is responding uh, in the time that you want and uh, appropriately. Ease of integration, well, we build the systems to suit our customers' requirements, whether it be going into a control room or a shelter, if it's going outside. And being a Canadian company, we understand Canadian requirements. As I said before, we know what, it, what the winters are like here. We understand the CSA requirements. We understand HASLOC requirements. All of those things are things that we deal with every single day. So the system will be suitable for installation uh, in our climate uh, and uh, in compliance with our requirements. And it's proven. Uh, we have dozens of installations, some of which have been running for over 10 years. Uh, so there's certainly lots of uh, evidence to back up the claims that we're making here today. So that's all I had for you today. Uh, looks like we finished in time to uh, get on to some questions. If anybody has any, I'll just minimize my screen here so I can see the chat and see if any questions have popped in. I don't see any questions right now. No questions so far, JC. Okay. 
No questions at all. I must have been really, really good. Well, certainly if uh, you have any questions, we have a few minutes, we'll stay on the line for a couple more minutes, uh, write them in here, or if you prefer, you can email us um, uh, at, uh, there's a contact form you'll see on the screen right now, novatech.ca, there's a contact form you can use there, uh, or you can email uh, uh, via the webinar invitation that you received before. And we'll be happy to send you more information or talk to you about any application that you may have. We have one question, JC. Okay. Does this does this system have the capability of manual validations? Yes, absolutely. So the uh, the validation is done. There's two forms of validation that can be done. Uh, one can validate the uh, the gas detector or analyzer, of course, to ensure that it's working properly. And that would just simply be done with a, a test gas or a cylinder gas uh, injected into the gas stream. Uh, or we can validate the performance of the entire system, and that's done via the septum seal, as I mentioned earlier. So with a syringe preparing a solution of hydrocarbon uh, in the right uh, dilution ratio and injecting it into uh, the water uh, prior to the, um, uh, the jet pump uh, to see the response of the uh, analyzer further downstream. We have another question. Can this type of system monitor groundwater running off from tank farm? Uh, yes, it could. Um, it would probably require some kind of uh, means of pulling that water into the system. We would need a pump more than likely. Uh, it would be important to look at the nature of the hydrocarbons in that tank farm. Uh, if it depends on that range of hydrocarbons, if you know this is usually uh, good from for the lighter hydrocarbons that will come into solution, so the C5s to C10s. If these are heavier hydrocarbons, C10 plus, uh, we might be looking at a different technique. We might uh, prefer to look at an optical technique such as uh, turbidity or UV or something along those natures. But we would have to look at the specific. Uh, application to say uh, yes or no. Uh, another one. Hi, JC. Have you guys done any applications for oil and water and produced water discharge for offshore oil rigs? Um, we haven't, personally. Um, Again, I, it's entirely possible that that would be a good application. We'd have to look again at the range of hydrocarbons. And I, I should clarify my point earlier about uh, the range of hydrocarbons. It's not that only C5 to C10 should be present for this to work. As long as some C5 to C10 is present, then this should work. So imagine you have a mixture of a range of hydrocarbons. If we have some of those lighter hydrocarbons present in that mixture, those will be picked up by the sparger, and that can be sufficient to identify uh, contamination or leak. Uh, we have done that in the past. Well, it sounds like that was the last question, so yes, I will thank everybody for joining us and uh, by all means, uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you think of something uh, later on. Thanks for your time, everyone.